So this is the Dada and Surrealism collection at the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art. It's world famous and it's world class. We've got fabulous things here. We've got paintings by Salvador Dali, Man Ray. We've got three paintings by Joan Miro. We've got 20 pictures by Max Ernst. We've got works by René Magritte, sculptures by Giacometti, paintings by Picasso. We've got the lot, really. Dada starts in the First World War. It's very much a rebellion against the ethos of uh, the artist's parents, really the people who gave them the First World War. No one actually knows who came up with the name Dada, but it was a sort of nonsense, childish, silly word that really represented what they wanted um, to go back to zero. And we can start with um, works by Man Ray. He's an American artist. He got to know uh, a number of the artists who went over from Paris to, uh, to New York just before the First World War, so Duchamp and Picabia. Man Ray is doing something extraordinary here. It looks like an abstract picture. In fact, all he's done is paint his own name, Man Ray, and then the date above it. But it's a sort of exemplary picture which represents what Dada's about. It's very much anti-art. It's against sort of uh, the traditional idea of history painting and landscape painting and so on. It just reduces painting to a signature and a date. Now, Dada had a certain sort of uh, lifespan in it. You can rebel for a certain amount of times and then it gets boring and repetitive. So what happened after the First World War, particularly in the early 20s in Paris, is that people started to take a more constructive view. They took the sort of antiness of Dada and brought it forward, and they investigated in particular dreams, the unconscious, the subconscious. And you can see this in particular in the work of Joan Miro, who's a fabulous artist, Spanish artist, born in 1893. So this is a work of 1924, it's called Maternity, and it's one of the sort of signature pieces, the earliest pieces of surrealist art. Surrealism means beyond realism, sure realism. And they wanted to go beyond the world of sort of ordinary reality into the world of dreams and the unconscious. It's a really sort of key work. It's a completely original thing to do in painting. We've got Salvador Dali, probably the most famous of all the surrealist artists. This work is 1928. It's called Bird. Dali was born in 1904. He comes to Paris in 1926 when he's just 22 years old. He meets Picasso. He knows Miro. Uh, he's done his homework. He sort of he, he sees the right people. He's been expelled from art college uh, in Spain, but he's a fabulous technician. He's already been through a cubism phase by this time, and he starts to see what's going on in the world of surrealism, and he locks onto it, and he's brilliant at it. And this is the work he's done in Cadiquez on the uh, Costa Brava, where his family had a, a home. What's amazing about it is that instead of painting the sand and the shingle, he's actually taken the sand and the shingle and stuck it on the wet paint or glue. It's a very novel idea. And then we've got a, a later work by Salvador Dali from the 1950s, Surrealism continues on. It doesn't sort of stop in 1939, as, as one might think. Uh, all the surrealist artists continue being surrealists uh, after the Second World War. This is a work of 1951. It's based on a painting by Raphael, a virgin looking down at the child. Uh, and what a master draftsman he is. This is just after the atomic explosion of, at Hiroshima, which splintered everything into a, billions of different bits. And he's starting to visualize the world in terms of a kind of nuclear reaction and also atoms so it's sort of it's being split into all these sort of exploding little atoms little sort of rhino horns almost and her head you can see is based on the pantheon building in rome where in fact raphael is buried exquisite bit of drawing this macabre bronze sculpture is by alberto giacometti you can see how a painter can realise dreams by painting them. He had some amazing dreams, obviously. In the morning, he would take notes about his dreams and then make a sculpture that exactly represented it. Um, he didn't ask what the dream meant to him. In fact, that's one of the big differences. Freud was interested in dreams and what they could explain about the person's psyche. The surrealists liked the fact that it couldn't be explained. They like the mystery rather than trying to solve the mystery. So this is um, Salvador Dali's Lobster Telephone, 1938. What a fantastic thing. 
viewers might have seen uh, other copies. There are 11 of these in other museums. There's one, uh, one or two in America, and there are some in Europe. Uh, this was the last one that was going to be available, and we bought it just uh, two years ago. So a lot of the artists involved in the Surrealist movement were painters. Um, they hadn't done any sculpture, but if they wanted to do a 3D work, instead of learning how to um, carve marble or, or carve wood or whatever, they came up with this brilliant idea called object sculpture. So rather than, it's like a 3D version of collage. So rather than create something from new, they'd take two uh, completely different things and put them together. So here, um, Dali's taken a plaster lobster and stuck it on a phone. There's one famous phrase which is often applied to the Surrealist. It's taken from a 19th century li literature, that they like the idea of a sewing machine and an umbrella meeting on a dissecting table. The most irrational things that you can think of happening in the most irrational way, in the most irrational space. But it's that kind of logic that really tickled the fancy of the Surrealists and is embodied in these object sculptures in the 30s. We've got great works by um, René Magritte, the Belgian artist. I don't think you'd see anywhere in the world five better Magritte than those, ranging from 1929 through the 30s, 1937. That's his only shaped canvas with a sort of body frame around it, probably inspired by Dali. And recently we were given this work of 1950 um, by the Drew Hines estate. I'm going to talk about a little bit about this one. It's 1929. We've already seen that amazing Dali bird, 1928, which was of the beach at Cadiz in Spain, and it actually includes the beach. Well, Magritte and Dali met in March 1929. They got on very, very well. Similar kind of artists. Um, Dali may be a bit darker, more to do with sex and so on, uh, but both very technical. Both were painting their dreams. So Magritte goes down to see Dali in the summer, in August. They go with some other people. Bunuel, who's just made that um, film of Chandelou with Dali, creates a sensation. They're the sort of hot ticket of the summer of 1929, and they're all together. There's seven or eight of them down in Cadiz. And it's the very beach that we've seen included in Dali's painting just now. Uh, that's the same beach. And Magritte is all about trying to make things that look right but when you think about it, are impossible. You don't have to think too hard about that being impossible with this uh, torso, tuba, and chair. Um, but a cracking work of 1929, which complements the other works of the 30s. So this is a work by the great German artist Max Ernst, um, who was involved with the Dada group and then the Surrealist group, and lived a very long and rich life, one of the most famous of the Surrealist artists. He was German. He studied philosophy at um, university, he didn't have any specific art training, so which almost enabled him to create new techniques. He wasn't sort of lumbered with uh, art school training. And he had two of the techniques that the Surrealists liked, which he combined in single works. He was one of the few who did this. So you've got this sort of photorealist almost, not that you've got heads that look like this, but very sort of traditional realist kind of technique for um, portraying the two figures. And the title is, um, Max Ernst showing a young girl the head of his father, or her father, depending on your understanding of the French. This is done in a realist technique. This is done in a technique known as grattage. He would have painted it, put it on, a, on the ground over uh, rough wooden blocks, and then scraped away so that you get that amazing uh, sort of rough texture in there. So we've got many works by Max Ernst, but a fabulous new acquisition, which we bought just two years ago, is this painting by Leonora Carrington. And it's a painting of Max Ernst. You can see why it fits perfectly here. Leonora Carrington was um, an Englishwoman. She was born in 1917. She didn't die that long ago, in 2011. An amazing long life. She was 20 years old when she met Max Ernst in London. He was over for a show in 1937. Uh, they got on terrifically well. He was 25 years older. Fell in love, went across to Paris. War's just starting. Go down to the south of France. And that's where she paints him in the sort of guise of a bird, the sort of feathery cloak with a kind of f funny kind of fishtail. And that's actually her in the background. She pictured herself very often in her paintings as a horse. So you've got her as a sort of frozen horse in the background. And here she is again in this lantern, sort of leading him on into the next chapter of his life. Mm -hmm.